My brothers and sisters, this should not be. But it is. Out of this mouth comes songs of praise like we just sung. And we mean it from the depth of our hearts. And then the drive home from church or right after we log off. And you know the other thing about you you need to know. <laughs> and you go, out of this mouth comes praise to God and cursing of people that God has made in his image. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. And yet James, and that passage that you read there were, were just the words of Scripture giving a warning for all time of the reality of the cost, the danger of our mouths. And James uses this, this image, this picture. The tongue also is a fire. The tongue is a fire. Here's the thing about fire. Here's the thing about fire. Fire can be wonderful. It's beautiful to look at. If it's in a fire ring, fireplace, keeps you warm. Kumbaya, my Lord. Kumbaya. Give me another marshmallow. Make some s'mores, you know. Kumbaya. It's, it's wonderful. You can heat up your food with it. Heat up your home. It's great. But that fire gets out of control in a forest, and the trees and the wildlife die. That fire gets out of control in a home, and things burn to the ground, and people die. The, the, the fire is at the same time beautiful and wonderful and helpful, and at the same time dangerous, right? And James says, that's your tongue. That's your words. That's why we got to watch our mouth. And, by the way, watch our thumbs, Send. <laughs> yeah, that'll get her. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah? Well, send, right? Watch your fingers, what you type in an email. Watch our words. Because our words have the potential to do indescribable good and beauty and incredible damage and pain. In my own life, the greatest, I would say the greatest pains I've experienced in this life have not been physical. They have been words from other people. And some of the greatest joys and blessings I've received in this life have been words from other people that they've written about me or spoken to me. And can I be honest? Probably the most damage I've done to other people in my life, people I love, people I care about, some of the greatest damage I've done has been with my words, both written and spoken. After I send that text and go back and go, Oh, I should have slowed down. I shouldn't have put it that way. And I've spoken words, and I see the face of the person as those words land. I make my living with words spoken and written. And those words can be some of the greatest blessings and some of the greatest curses in all my life. And so I invite you to listen to God's word from James. You saw it on the screen, but I want you to hear these words as an invitation to you, as an invitation to me about the power of what we speak and what we write and what we text and what we tweet and what we retweet. Because by the way, when you retweet, it becomes your words. I didn't say it, they did. Send it along. Right? What about our words? Verse 6 of James chapter 3. The tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. The tongue corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Wow. There's a warning. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by, by people, by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Just pause there for a minute. What's James saying? He's saying, you, you can't tame your tongue. The minute you think you have your tongue under control, the minute you don't have to worry about your words, both written and spoken, the minute you let down your guard, boom, there it goes again. See, there's never a point where you go, I got this one so under control, I can drop my guard. Be careful of the words you communicate in any way, shape, or form. Verse 9. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Do you know that when you shoot verbal bullets 
at other people, when you speak about other people who are on the other side of whatever topic it is you happen to be dealing with. You know, each of those people is made in the image of God. How we speak, what we write, how we communicate matters to the heart of God. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Lord Jesus, this is our prayer today. That we would learn to watch our mouths. That we would become people who know what it is to speak words of blessing, that build, that encourage, and be deeply concerned about the things that we speak that may break your heart, break someone else's heart and life and sense of meaning, that could speak ill of others and damage them when they're not there to protect themselves. We dare to pray today, whether we're at home or family worship venue or here in the worship center, we dare to pray, Spirit of God, search us and show us where we can do better in guarding our mouths and also do better in speaking words of blessing and encouragement, writing words of blessing and encouragement. We pray this for the glory of Jesus. Amen. We need to watch our mouth. We need to watch our thumbs, what we text, watch our fingers, what we email, what we type, what we send out. And there's all kinds of words, spoken words that we speak to someone, spoken words about someone who's not there. Words we shoot off in a quick little text, the angry tweet. I'm not sending it to anyone in particular. I'm going after everyone. Right? The retweet. The email. Pastor Dennis has taught our staff here that he said when you send it, if you're dealing with something and you're feeling intensely, you're feeling with frustration or anger, and you write an email, he said, never send it right after you're done writing it. Go back and read it again. And as you read it, you might just go, oh, wow, yeah, I better... Cool that off. I've had things I've written that I've edited two or three times to get to where I think that they're really safe. And I'll let my wife read it and she'll go, oh no, (laughs) you're not there yet. Have you ever found that sometimes the greatest gifts that God gives you can be used as a shadow side and be damaging? I have a gift to communicate with words, but I also have a gift to hurt with words. And I have to be very, very careful. And I think we all do. Beware of words posted in the comments section on any internet discussion. I don't think I'm overstating it when I say the comment section in most internet posts is straight from the pit of hell. Evil, wicked, nasty. Sniper shots from off on a distant hill where nobody sees you. Name, happy, happy bunny. (laughs) Comment, you horrible, rotten, filthy, right? We don't have to put our name It used to be when you talked with somebody and you shared a concern, you'd look them in the eyes, right? Now we go, send, send. And and it's dangerous. I think in some ways the challenge with our words has been compounded because of the technology in our world and because of the nature of all we've gone through in the last 14 or 15 months. There's lots of intense feelings. In In this moment in time, We need to be very, very careful with our words. Always, but especially right now. And in light of all these challenges, I invite you to listen to this one single verse from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. If you've never memorized a verse of the Bible, this would be a great one to memorize. Ephesians 4, 29. Here's what the Apostle Paul writes to the church. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. And he says, but but four things, but only what is helpful. When I speak these words, will it help the people who hear? Is it helpful? Have you ever asked that question before you speak, before you tweet, before you write? Okay, only what is helpful for building others up. Are they a better person after I've spoken these words, after I've communicated these words? Have I built them up? Now, let me be clear. The Bible isn't saying don't confront real problems and deal with real issues. We have to do that. Sherry and I are creeping toward next month. We'll have been married for 37 years. And let me tell you something. We've had some disagreements on things. At least weekly and sometimes daily. We work through things. We have to talk through things. We have to deal with tough challenges. Doesn't mean ignore those things. But it's how you do it. It's the tone. It's the words that we choose and the words that we use. So, so... Do these words build? Sometimes dealing with a tough topic actually ultimately builds the person up, builds up the relationship, but you do it the right way. 
building others up according to their needs. Does this meet needs that they have? Do you stop and think about the other people, needs of other people as you're communicating? That it may benefit those who listen, for those who hear, for those who read. Do they say, this is of benefit to me. This benefits me. This one passage, don't let any unwholesome talk, the warning, but only what is helpful, builds others up, meets their needs, and benefits them. Man, if we could speak words like that, it would change our relationship. Imagine a church with thousands of people and every person lived out that one verse. People would be drawn to a place like that because words would be used to bless and build up and to encourage. So I want to share three different kinds of words I think we need to be careful of. And, and the first two I'm going to touch on quickly. The third one we're going to dig into because it's the one that seems to get done the most and noticed the least. So here's the first one. The subversive evil of gossip. The subversive evil of gossip. We live in a world where gossip is, is built into culture. There's shows that are all about gossip. But gossip isn't seen as a sin by most people. But the Bible sees it as a sin. What do we mean when we say goss- gossip? It, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, and I went, I've got a legal definition. I got another, de- I found a couple of definitions that might help us. Is, well, what do we mean by gossip? Talking about a person's personal life when they are not present. They're not there to explain or defend themselves. Creating, sharing, or repeating a rumor about another person. Or creating, sharing, or repeating a rumor that is overheard or hearsay. You might have made it up yourself or somebody else might have said it, but you pass it on. And the person is not there to defend themselves. Gossip is sharing information that ought not be shared. Slander is is spreading false information. We need to understand that one can be gossiping and slandering at the same time. Not, at the same time, and one can be gossiping and not slandering at the same time. In other words, gossip can be true and slander is false. Here's the point. Our words can be so toxic and so poisoning and when another person is not there to defend themselves, we shouldn't be speaking those words about them. Because here's the thing. If they were there, right there, listening, often what we say, we wouldn't say. When you find yourself doing this, So anyways, something's wrong. And if you're going to say something about someone and they're not there, and it's not building them up and blessing them and flattering about them, the Bible would warn us. As a matter of fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20 says this. This is one little verse. It gives a list of these different sins against God and against people. The Apostle Paul writes, For I am afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be, and you may not find me as you want me to be. We're all imperfect. I fear that there may be discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. Slander and gossip, speaking poorly about other people. And you know how we cover ourselves oftentimes when we're gossiping? We cover ourselves with this simple statement. Well, it's true. She did that, you know. He is like that. It's true. But let me ask you a question. Would you like everything about you that's true to be publicized and shared with other people, to be posted and put out there for the world to see? If everything that's true about all of us, everything we thought, said, or done about all of us was put in front of the world, we'd all look bad. So why pass things on about someone else? whether it's true or not. And oftentimes with gossip, we don't even know it's true. We just heard someone say that they heard from somebody else. And we just, it's like Proverbs says, gossip is like tasty morsels that go down to the inner part of the person. It's like, oh, this is delicious. I gotta tell someone else. But the Bible says it's sin. So we need to learn uh, to, to take this posture of overcoming the temptation of gossip. We've got, we've got to say, I don't want to be a person who gossips. I don't want my words to be used to damage somebody else's reputation, to damage their character, to hurt them. So how do we overcome the temptation to gossip? A couple thoughts. First, recognize the damage. Gossip damages people. It hurts people. Even when people act like they don't care, it hurts any person who's gossiped about. Also, we need to identify that gossip is the behavior of a coward. Gossip is the behavior of a coward. If you wouldn't say those words were the person there, why would you take a sniper shot from a distant hill and attack them when they're not there to protect themselves? That's cowardly behavior. 
When you listen to gossip, when you're speaking gossip, you're, you're functioning in a way, we're functioning in ways that are cowardly. How do we overcome the temptation to gossip? We call it what it is. Gossip is sin. It's not recreational activity. It's not just chatting about stuff. You know when you're gossiping. You know when you're listening to gossip. You recognize it. There's something inside you that's kind of like, oh, I hope, okay, are, are they here? Are they going to hear about this? When you start thinking those things, oh, this is walking into the, te- the territory of gossip and turn away from it. How do we overcome the temptation to gossip? We need to learn not to do it and also not to listen to it. Do you understand that you're fanning the flames of gossip when you listen? And there's a lot of Christians particularly, well, I wouldn't gossip, but man, I love to listen. Love to hear it. And we're fanning the flames. And so here's a question. When are you tempted to engage in gossip? And how can you decrease and eventually remove this behavior from your life? When are you tempted to gossip? What's the settings? What friends are you with? What church settings might you be in? What social settings are you where that's just kind of part of the culture of what goes on in that setting? And let me, if you're a note taker, write down these three things to remove. I'll give you three things to remove if you want to fight against this. Remove the thoughts. Remove the thoughts of gossip. When you hear something, you read something, oh, I can't wait to tell someone about that. You start, oh, they'd love to hear about this. And you almost start to plan in your mind this sin. That just say, God, I want to get rid of those thoughts. I think one of the best ways to get rid of negative thoughts is to fill your mind with positive thoughts. I would challenge you to memorize that Ephesians passage. And every time you start to think about gossiping, go over that passage. Go over that passage. Go over that passage. We'll come back to that at the end of the message again. But meditate on that passage. So remove the thoughts. Then then remove the words. Say, I'm not going to speak words about other people that I would not speak if they were standing right here. And for some of you, it's like, man, I'm not going to say very much because I spent a lot of time talking about other people. Well, maybe you can replace it with saying positive things. And that, just like on the news, that's not quite as popular. People tend to to gravitate towards the negative and say, I'm I'm just going to speak words of blessing, words that are positive. I'm not going to, and so so you remove the thoughts, remove the words, I'm not going to speak those words anymore, begin to change your behavior, and then remove yourself. Remove your thoughts, remove the words, remove yourself. Don't listen to it. Don't get sucked into it. So you say, well, you're saying, I'm in a situation at work and people are all gossiping to get up and walk out if you have to. And don't do this. You people disgust me. And st- st- don't, no, just, just say, oh, hey, I got I to gotta slip out of here. We'll see you guys later. Remove yourself. Say, well, then I'm going to miss out on all the choice, tasty morsels. Yeah. But you also won't be tempted to pass it on. And you're not fanning the flames of gossip for other people. And so this, this is the first area we need to kind of pause and say, so just quiet your heart for a moment. Say, Lord, what are the situations where I'm tempted to gossip, where I listen to gossip, where I talk about other people, even in a Christian setting, even like I'm, I'm kind of sharing it like it's a prayer request or something, but I'm really just talking bad about someone. When am I tempted? And God, help me to recognize gossip, to see it for what it is, and to not engage in a growing measure to walk away from that part of that temptation to sin. So gossip, God says, deal with that. Here's the next thing, the poison of lies. When we let our mouth speak things that are not true. And there's all kinds of studies that have been done that show how many times people lie in a day or a week. And every study I've ever looked at is just like terrifying. It's just like, oh my gosh, can this even be true? But And even of ourselves to say that we we shade things, we shadow things, we change things. We don't speak the truth. We we lie about things. So when we say lies, what are we talking about? It's an It's an assertion of something known or believed by the speaker or writer to be untrue with the intent to deceive. When you lie, you say, I know it's not true, but I'm going to say it. My goal is to deceive or mislead the other person. It's an untrue or inaccurate statement that may or may may not be believed true by the speaker or writer. You may say, I don't know if it's true or not, but I'm going to say it as if it is true. There's lots of things being peddled today as being true that, that... cause a lot. I mean, we live in a culture where it, it just feels like lying is pervasive in almost every aspect of culture. But Proverbs 12, says this, and this is strong. The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in people who are trustworthy. Are our words trustworthy? Do people know when we say something, we are speaking the truth because we're speaking as people who follow Jesus? 
We compromise our witness. We compromise our testimony of who we are as Christians if we're not people who speak the truth. And sometimes the best way to speak the truth is learn to close your mouth and not say anything else in lots of circumstances. We need, we need to be overcoming the temptation to lie or to not really tell the truth. And here's a question just to reflect on. Where have you been lying and how can you start telling the truth or at least keep your mouth shut? What are the settings where you have been tempted to tell a lie or you've gotten into a pattern of lying? Think about lying as lying gives birth to lies, gives birth to lies. When you start lying about something, you just have to cover up those lies with other lies. And so let's quiet our hearts again. And would you just say, and maybe you're a follower of Jesus, maybe you're just visiting Shoreline Online or here on our campus, and this is all new to you. But would you say, God, if you're there, if you believe in Jesus, say, Jesus, would you show me where my words have been dishonest, where I've been trapped in the pattern of lying? And would you help me see that, that this breaks your heart and undermines your, your work in my life? And would you teach me to see the damage of lying and to walk as a person of truth? To take a moment and ask God to show you where you need to grow in this area. So we need to beware of gossip. We need to name lies as sins and fight against those. But here's the third one. And I want to lean into this in a little bit more detail. The toxic nature of grumbling, whining, and complaining. Grumbling, whining, and complaining is toxic. It is deadly. And it is common in our world. And it's common, unfortunately, in the church. Let me give you a definition of grumbling, whining, and complaining. It's the practice or disposition of pointing out what we don't like or don't agree with in a consistent and negative manner that makes no effort to correct the problem. See, whiners, grumblers, complainers are not trying to fix anything. They're just whining and complaining. Yeah, I don't really like that music that we sing at church. You know that Pastor Kevin, he just goes on and on and on. You know, my, my boss is like this, and you know, she's really, she's just you know, so thoughtless and so unkind. Well, my friend, well, my parents, well, my kids, well, my, and just, and I think in the last 14 months, the potential for things to grumble and whine and complain about have grown. And we can grumble and whine and complain about people who have a different perspective than us, but if it's not redemptive, we're not trying to change anything, we're just venting and constantly pouring out and spewing negative things, it's damaging, it's dangerous. And the Bible actually identifies grumbling, whining, and complaining as a sin with costs and consequences. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I want to lean into this passage because this passage really uh, unfolds very, very powerful stuff that as, as followers of Jesus, we need uh, to dig into and we need to think about. And so turn with me to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and what we're going to find out is that grumbling, whining, and complaining breaks the heart of God, it does damage to the person who grumbles and complains, it hurts the people who hear it, and if you're a Christian, it compromises the church and it impacts our world. That's how bad this sin is. Follow along with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to begin in verse 6. And in this passage, what you're going to see, the Apostle Paul is looking back at when the people of Israel, the people of God in the Old Testament, were wandering in the desert. And the, for the 40 years they were in the desert. And when you live in a desert for 40 years, there's things to whine and grumble and complain about. No question about it. It's a tough place to be. But they got themselves there anyways. They put themselves there by their own kind of bad choices and lack of faith. But while they're there, they complained a lot. So the Apostle Paul goes through four different like major sins of the people of Israel in the, in the wilderness. And what's interesting is I think he's building to the fourth one because it was the most common of the four sins. So follow along with me in 1 Corinthians 10, beginning in verse 6. The Apostle Paul writes, Now these things occurred, these things back in the wilderness days, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on e the evil things as they did. See, so these are, these are here to remind us not to live like this. So then he goes through the four sins. Here they are. Verse 7, the first sin. Do not be idolaters. Don't worship idols. As some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. So the first sin, idolatry. That's a big deal to God. Second sin, verse 8. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. So he's that serious, right? Sexual immorality. Verse 9, the third sin. We should not test Christ, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. 
These are all serious sins with consequences. Verse 10, watch this. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Another sin that brings judgment. Verse 11. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as a warning for who? For us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you're standing, I'm fine, nothing's going to happen to me. Be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. Everyone deals with these kind of temptations. This is all of us. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Do you get the picture? This sin of grumbling is not treated like a light thing. And here's the problem in the church. We treat a grumbling, negative, complaining, whiny spirit like it's no big deal. Well, you know, that's just old Bill. He's always complaining, always got something negative to say. It's, you know, we're all used to it. It's no big deal. We don't, we don't confront it. That, that's Bill. He's just like that. Well, that's Janice. You know, she's just kind of negative. She's just kind of a, she's always got something. But don't, don't worry about it. That's just Janice. That's just what she's like. We treat it like it's not a big deal. We don't do that with other sins. You know, that's Bill. He kills people. Uh, you know, Bill, he's a murderer. Um, every month or two he loses it. and then. But, you know, but hey, that's Bill. We don't do that. Oh, that's Janice, you know. She's been sleeping her way through the church board. You know, you know Janice, she's just kind of frisky. Um, we're not going to worry about it, though. No! You know, everybody, you're like, no, that's a big deal! We don't just make light of it, but we do with a whiny, complaining spirit. And here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I think the Apostle Paul is building up from idolatry to immorality to testing Christ to grumbling because that was the most common sin of God's people in the wilderness. And it's a hugely common sin in the church today. How much time do we spend whining and complaining and grumbling about things we don't like in the church, in the political world, in our relational world, in our society? And, and, we, and, and here's the point. There's concerns to deal with. Deal with it graciously in a godly way, in a prayerful way. But just whining and grumbling and complaining is toxic. It's poison. It's deadly. And so we're warned to be careful. Why is this such a big deal? Why would God list this sin with idolatry, immorality, and testing God? And the answer is because, is because it's so destructive. It's so sinister because it creeps in and we don't even notice it. It creeps into our hearts. Now, I think all of us need to take some time today and just be quiet and say, have I become, no, don't say have I become, say this, where have I become a grumbler and a whiner and a complainer? With no redemptive effort to make anything different, I just complain about stuff. Invent the negativity. Now, are there negative things? Yes. But how do we deal with them? Is it just to grumble and complain and to whine? That helps nothing. Take some time and say, Lord, what? And, 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 then, and then you say, well, so, okay, maybe that's, maybe that's a problem. Maybe it's a problem for all of us. Uh, what's the antidote? How do we, how do we fight against it? It's, it's what I would call the beauty of blessing. Let's say, okay, with my words, instead of, and there's always something negative you can find to focus on. There's, there's always something negative in every part of the world to find that you can focus on. If you can't find anything out there, look in yourself. You can find something negative in the world. It's just, the world's a tough place. But are, are we just going to vent and whine and grumble and complain? And the beauty of blessing is we start to consume our minds and our hearts with using our words to build up and to bless, to write a text that blesses someone. Some, somebody came to Sherry after the first service. They'd given, uh, the last book Sherry wrote was, uh, was Praying with Eyes Wide Open. They'd given this book to their mom. Their mom had read half of it and just finished the book in the last week or two. And, and the mom wrote this beautiful text, just thank, say, will you let Sherry know what that book meant to me and how much I learned about prayer and how much it impacted my life. And I sat there as, as she read this to Sherry and then read it to me. And I know what a blessing that was. When you labor over something and you d didn't make any difference and it comes and says, it, it impacted my life. What if we consumed our minds and our energy and our mouths and our thumbs and our fingers with blessing and building up? What if we said, I don't want any unwholesome talk to come out of my mouth, off my thumbs, off my fingers in any way, but I want to communicate what is helpful, what builds others up, what meets their needs, and what benefits them. 
What a difference that would make. I think about the group that was up here leading us in worship today. They get here at about 5 o'clock on Sunday mornings. Many of them are volunteers. And they'll be here leading worship in the outdoor service after this one. And then most of them will stick around and help us clean up afterwards. And besides that, during the week, they'll practice their songs to get ready to lead you in worship. What if you, what if you just, on a Sunday morning, as you, as you worship, maybe you looked up and you saw, you, know, you saw somebody playing an instrument or singing, and you thought, man, what a blessing they are. And you sat down and you wrote them a note. And you may have to go to someone and say, hey, who's, that, who's that gal that was singing over here? I haven't seen her sing. She actually works with our youth in the church. But who's that gal? Okay. And you just sent a note and said, thank you for using your voice to honor Jesus and to bless him. You help me worship my Savior. You help bring me into the presence of God. Do you think that would matter to that person? You know it would. And when you're doing that, you're not thinking about what you complain about. You're focusing on what you can bless. What if, and I'm going to get wild here, what if a teenager sat down and wrote a note to dad or mom and said, thank you for all your hours of work and all you do and for all you provide. I know I don't say it very often, but it means the world to me and I really love you. Right? Do you know how much time we would have to bless if we just stopped grumbling, complaining, gossiping? If we use that time to, can you imagine what our community, what our church would look like if we just took all that time and shifted it over to noticing and blessing everywhere we can. And for some of us, it's going to be tricky at the very beginning because we're not used to it. We're used to kind of pointing out what's wrong. And, but to say, God, commit Ephesians 4.29 to memory. Lord, what is helpful, what builds others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who hear the words. And what, what could happen in our homes, in our church? What would happen in the political arena, the social arena, if people would, anytime they could, actually give a word of blessing or encouragement to another person. Hey, we may disagree on this. We may not, we may not see eye to eye on that. But I want to thank you for this. We become so polarized. And, and God has answers to that. The antidote to grumbling, complaining, whining, gossiping, lying, is to get our words, our, our typed words, our written words, our spoken words, focused on blessing and building up and encouraging Consume yourself with that and watch what God does. And then when your words go off, as they do sometimes when they shouldn't, say, God, I'm sorry, forgive me, because it's a sin. I don't want to live that way and retrain yourself and just circle back around to that which is blesses and builds up. Watch people and say, I appreciate this about you. I believe in you. I, believe, I, see, I see what God's doing in you. I, to say to someone, I, I was watching you and I've learned this from you. And I'm a better person because of your example in my life. I noticed this about you, how you, how you care for your kids. Bring words of blessing. Last night, or two nights ago, uh, two nights ago, Sherry and I were in the third row up here on the balcony, right where you guys are sitting right there, and for the, uh, the Trinity High School graduation. And the row in front of us had about a group of eight or nine people, and then they had a little boy with them who looked to be like maybe four or five years old. And you know how much four and five-year-olds love sitting quietly for an hour and 15-minute graduation ceremony, right? So this little guy... When we first got there, he was laying in the empty row between us there, just like laying there, and he was like playing with toys and just like trying to, he's like just trying to be good. And, and then he'd get up and he'd like walk along the whole row behind each one. He'd like you know, smell the, each one's hair, go along, and then he'd kind of like rub his head against their head. And they were all very sweet with him. And then the last four or five minutes, he just started losing it. He was like, it was like, you could, he didn't say it because it was long. He was like, enough, can I get out of here? But he, just, he started, and, the, and somebody kind of was holding him and he was struggling. On the way out, I just, I just went by him and I said, hey, I said, so you did really good today. You were working really hard at being, being good. I think, and I think they were embarrassed that the last few minutes he kind of started to lose it. I was impressed that he made it for an hour and 11 minutes <laughs> without losing it. Because I lose it sitting still for an hour, you know. <laughs> I'm pretty energetic. And so, but, but I thought, I just wanted to say something, right? We can do that in, as, in our lives. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. Lord, that's our prayer today. We pray that we would be people who would use our words to be a blessing. Lord, that if we have gotten into a pattern of whining and grumbling and complaining and we haven't even noticed it until just now, if we've become gossips and haven't recognized that it's a heartbreaking sin, 
if we're not speaking the truth, if we're telling lies, Lord, would you speak to us about our mouths? Would you bring truth to our hearts? And Lord, we pray that we would counter these things by aggressively, intentionally, moment by moment, looking for ways to bless, encourage, and build up with our words, with the words we write and speak. Lord, move in our hearts that we might become the kind of people that would honor you and bless others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I invite you to stand up and send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give you a couple of invitations. One is I want to let you know about a ministry that some of you may not know about that could be very, very valuable to you. It's called our lay counseling ministry. And Pastor Dennis, who leads our prayer team, but also leads, our, leads a bunch of ministry teams, one of them is lay counselors. These are people that are trained over time. Not everyone who's trained is able to do it, but once they're trained and vetted and certified as lay counselors, they're not licensed therapists. They're biblical lay counselors. But the lay counseling is five or six sessions that are free for anyone who's part of Shoreline Church or anyone you know and love that could use some help and support. And so if you know somebody that could use someone that could listen to them, talk with them, pray with them, bring biblical wisdom, and maybe that person's you, contact the church or look at you. There's information up here about, uh, about the information counseling at shoreline.church. And we have a whole new team, right, Dennis, in January. They're gonna start training a whole, you're going to start training a whole new team of lay counselors to add to the ones we already have. And so if that would be helpful for you, contact the church, and we want to get you connected there. Also, uh, one of my favorite nights of the month is the first Wednesday night of the month at 6.15. We meet here on our campus outdoors right now for our, our night of worship time where we have communion together, where we, uh, where we study God's word and worship and praise God together. It's a service for those that have put their faith in Jesus and want to go deep in their faith. So 6.15 Wednesday night, we're going to continue looking at what's in the name, the names of God, and how his names help us worship him more passionately. If you need prayer and you're here in the worship center on our campus or in the family worship venue, just come around right over here and the team over here is ready to pray for you. Whatever your need is, join them for prayer. And if you're, uh, if you're online, you can email us a prayer to the email address you see on the screen and we'll put it on our prayer list or you can call the number you see and there's someone waiting right now to pray with you voice to voice. If you call and it's busy, that means our prayer team is all full but we'll, they'll be available in a couple minutes. Try again after a couple minutes. And if you're here on the campus and you are new, we want to give you a warm personal welcome. So just go to the, through the lobby here, either from the family worship venue over here or here in the worship center out here to the lobby. And they want to give you at the Connection Center a gift and answer your questions to give you a warm personal welcome. And if you're online, just text the word welcome to the number you see on the screen and we will respond back and give you a digital welcome card and connect with you the best way we can uh, online wherever you are. And, and so, and if you if you're, uh, need prayer, come forward for prayer. If you are new, make sure if you're here in the worship center, you go by there. If you're online, get, uh, let us know you're there. And I want to invite you now just to stand with me. If you're at home, family worship venue, or in the worship center, and you're able to stand, will you stand? And I think you know what the blessing is going to be about today. Uh, the word of blessing I want to give to you, but I'm not going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to us. Because I will tell you, I need this blessing as much as we all do with our words. So may we go from here. profoundly aware that our words have power more than we know. May we beware of gossip and lying and grumbling and complaining. And may we lavish others with words of blessing and kindness and goodness and grace. May we bring healing with our words for the glory of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. And we'll see you Wednesday night, 615, right here for Night of Worship. God bless you.